See, I'm wondering to figure out how I can do that. Because I don't think. What if the school can get it? You know. Because I can bring it up. I can't work with that. I don't know how it's working. Wow. Yeah. 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 I may want to know if you're feeling the rest of the runner after I get my yeah. drawing stuff. Yeah. Brian, did you get it? Yeah. Brian, what I'm saying well, is like, it's, your, it's kind of like a new project, but not really. Which one is this? Okay. That's not bad. Uh, one in the line. Yeah. Yeah. It has like a social solution. Look like from across the room. No, I guess. Like, 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 But while you guys uh, pass that around, like throughout class, I want you looking at those are all hotels or skyscrapers. So um, look at the presentation of how they're presenting. You know, there's probably like one or two, or maybe even four pages of, of each of their work, <clears throat> and it's all um, you know, kind of complicated looking stuff, but. It's all things that I think we're going to be able to do. Not exactly the same, but... started passing around a book called uh, it's Evola and it's the skyscraper competition from pretty much all the rest of the I guess all the years that they've actually been doing it um, basically you know, I want you guys to flip through that book as we talk in class um, there's a lot of uh, skyscrapers and even hotels that are shown in there 
Uh, it looks like a lot of the stuff that is in there is things that you guys have been working on. And um, I just want you guys to look at how they present their work. And one of the things that I told you guys last class was that we're not going to be doing construction documents for the final. And I'm going to do a lecture here on construction documents uh, just so you can kind of see uh, kind of the next step in Revit once you designed your work and where you're going next, uh, which would be in the office, hopefully somewhere. You'll be um, working on construction documents in the professional world. And I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of the, the lecture of, this is an example project from uh, 2000, I guess we finished it around 2009, uh, for Colorado State University. This is a 55,000 square foot laboratory building. I just want to show you some of the things in Revit um, you know, basically it was designed and developed in Revit, and then eventually uh, the construction documents were completed. And since, um, I don't know how many of you have ever had any kind of experience with construction documents. You guys uh, want to raise your hands if you've worked on CDs before? Anybody? Nope? Okay. So this is going to be a good uh, precursor to what you guys will eventually be looking at once you're in the office because that is your next step of where your Revit career is going to take you. Um, you're professionals, I believe, in Revit. When you guys put this information on your resume and in your portfolio about this class, you guys need to talk about how you guys have really done everything from conceptual design and these complicated forms all the way to you know what you're doing with these hotels. And my goal of this class was to get you guys some really nice images and drawings that you could present in a portfolio, especially to whoever you're going to be interviewing for um, in the near future. Um, because a lot of the items that we've covered in this class, most offices have not. And you'll be kind of coming in there with a certain level of expertise that I believe uh, would get you right in the door, um, or should at least elevate you high on the list. Um, the other part is Autodesk um, has a certification program that you can actually get certified in Autodesk Revit. It's basically taking a test, you pay some money, you take a test, and they have you do a couple things in, in the test, and when you're done, you get a certificate. That could be a good thing for you guys to do if you guys want to uh, get another little um, tick mark on your resume. Um, having that, you know, there are a lot of firms that, first of all, they want to see that you have Revit experience. And um, next item is they, once you get in the door, you know, they're going to give you a test to see if you really know Revit. And the stuff that is on the Autodesk uh, certification test, I haven't taken it, but I've just looked at it. Um, it it's really kind of simple things. It's like drawing a wall, adding a sweep, adding a reveal, uh, putting, you know, something onto a page, which we're going to go over today, adding a door editing a door, you know, all these things that you guys have kind of already done throughout the class, and you've actually done a lot more, I, I don't think there would be any reason why you would um, not be able to answer or go through all those exercises on that test. The only thing would be you could uh, review, you know, they might have some questions on there about phasing and, um, you know, design options, which we kind of briefly went over. Um, so. Anyway, you can go to Autodesk uh, website and look at, you know, just kind of Google Revit architecture certification and you'll come up with all these sites that will show you uh, pretty much what they're testing on. So that, that is an option if you guys are interested. Do they show like um, the stuff we did in the first half of the class, like the adaptive components and stuff like that? No, that's, it's that's like, like not, yeah, it's very basic. And um, the stuff that we did at the very beginning of the semester, was very complicated, complex things that are being done in Revit that you guys all, I believe, mastered. And you're going to be able to apply it to your hotels because a lot of you have just asked me a question about how are we supposed to skin the rest of our hotel? You know, we're work working on the interior and um, I've got these complicated forms and these mass forms and, you know, what am I going to, I can't apply a curtain wall to it. But remember, during the bridge project, we worked extensively on curtain panel pattern-based families. That is how you'll finish up your exterior of your hotel, especially with your complicated, uh, the complicated forms. That is recording good. Okay. Um, so, 
you know, basically if you have any kind of walls that are exterior walls that are straight up and down, you could obviously use those curtain uh, wall techniques that we went over in class. Uh, but once you deviate from straight up and down, you've got to really go back to those adaptive components and also the curtain panel pattern-based families. The only difference between the bridge and now is that you probably want some other design for your, you know, component. So you have to kind of think about, you know, what, what that design might be. And then instead of having open voids, you're probably going to want to fill that void in with glass uh, so that that actually renders as a, as a glass element. Uh, so, you know, you can start thinking about that. And the nice thing about the hotels and the way they're masked, uh, I've looked at a lot of yours, is that, you know, you've got a lot of different volumes uh, going on that, you, you know, you don't have to have that same curtain panel component always applied, you know, across the board. You could vary it a little bit. You guys you already know how to kind of switch them out here and there. So, you know, come up with some ideas. And, and actually, to be honest, on the, um, you know, skyscraper type design, a lot of that curtain panel pattern-based families are, uh, you know, pretty simple compared to what we did with the bridges. Because we're not doing all these curvilinear, you know, uh, I guess most of us aren't doing these real complicated, you know, facades. It's more just kind of a tilted or a twisted, you know, almost straight up and down type of thing. So it's all about how you divide it up, probably frame that curtain panel and put some glass in there. And when that book comes around, you know, you guys flip through that, you'll see a lot of interesting uh, skyscraper designs and, um, you know, not all of that obviously was done in Revit, but all of it could have been, I believe. When, when we're doing um, our adaptive curtain panel for the whole thing, if we have um, areas and balconies or something, how do we divide that mass up so if we don't have the curtain panel go over? Yeah, so if you have your mass, eventually uh, what you're going to have to do is um, you can do a couple things. You can either put mass voids, you know, in that spot where the, the balcony is, because remember, once you have a void and you apply your divided surface, that hole remains. Mm -hmm. The other item would be you put your curtain panel all over the entire surface, and you can individually select each curtain panel and delete it. Oh, um, so if you make the doors that Yeah, so you can, you can actually, you know, um, kind of, you'll have to do a little bit of play between that facade and, and your balconies and, and things like that. Um, let me just go over construction documents, and uh, one reason I didn't really go into this too much in detail in class is because, um, you know, really what you really need to know about Revit is all of these 3D modeling techniques that we've covered, but then eventually you get to a point where you're not moving things around anymore, or, or not as much, at least you've settled on a lot of great ideas. And so, you know, what we've done in this class has probably led you through design development of most of your projects. Once you get after design development, that's when you would start the construction document phase. That's where, in some firms, they have design studios, and the design, design studio hands off this project over to a construction document studio who then, you know, develops it and produces it for all the technical drawings that are required for the contractor. Um, but there's also a lot of offices like the way we operate at the FWA group is you get a project from the very beginning and if you're on that project team, you're doing programming, schematic design, design development, and then you're going into construction documents, doing specifications, and then doing all the construction administration on that usually. Um, so basically there are a lot of instances where you have to follow your project all the way through. And um, that's actually a, a really important aspect I think of a lot of firms if you can get into one that does that is because you're able to experience all those different levels of development of the project but once you get to a certain level you know we have to produce and put our work and our model on paper so that it can be you know bid it, it can be sent out to code officials can be sent out to the owner for their review it can be sent out to contractors for them to bid on and then someone's got to build it. So once uh, you've com kind of completed your design, you got to tell somebody exactly what they're looking at in all different types of representation. So just like you have presented your work through studio and other classes in plan and section and elevation and 3D and even in renderings, uh, those are all part of construction documents. And part of construction documents is looking at each part of the building
from one scale to the other. So you're always looking at kind of an overview and then down to a very detailed overview or a detailed um, component that would just get, get even down to, you know, how does the window get installed? You know, what's the, what's the head of that window look like? What are all the parts that go into there? Because you have to be able to describe all that on paper so that one, someone can estimate and get all that product, but you're also trying to convey to somebody construction uh, standards and construction quality of what you expect for the contractor to do. Now, if you ever look at older drawings, and some of you have with the computational uh, practice class, you know, we've been looking at record drawings of the School of Architecture. Once you go before pretty much 1990, in any project, so if you were to work on an existing building and you get the record documents of that building and it was built before 1990, which is probably the majority of the renovation projects that you'll do, um, it's amazing to me that they even built off of those drawings because they didn't provide a whole lot of detail back then. It was all hand drawn and or you know, CAD was just getting introduced at that time. Uh, but it was all hand drawn and you know there's a lot of labor that goes into hand drawing things and making changes and all that kind of stuff so you, they didn't expect a lot of detail plus the construction trade was a lot more you know i, I don't want to sound bad here but they're a lot more skilled in their their fields and they didn't they actually did a lot of the uh, building and detailing themselves as they were you know working on the project so they would get the idea from the architect and then they knew how everything went together or should go together and they put it um, you know, together and architect didn't really have to worry about showing that level of detail. You still get a lot of contractors like that in the, you know, the residential, uh, sometimes in the residential um, portion of architecture uh, that you know, you'll get the guy that's been doing it for you know, 40, 50 years that you, know, you don't have to show him a window detail because he already knows what to do. But, Nowadays, because of computers, more and more people are expecting that there is a lot more detail that can be shown about the projects. Projects are also getting more and more complicated, as you can see from our hotels and our bridge designs. The computer allows us to start to do these more complicated projects that, you know, I don't even know how you would begin to draw half of that stuff with hand and convey it to somebody to build. And now with the computer, you're able to do that. That's where construction documents nowadays are really starting to show just a lot of detail and the contractors are expecting that and so are the owners. And it's also a good idea to show a lot of detail because when you're in the field and something doesn't look right, you can point to your drawing and say it's supposed to be like this and that's what you're, basically your drawings are for is to say this is how it's supposed to be and I expect it to look like that when it's built. Um, so I'm just gonna peruse through some of these uh, drawings. I'm not gonna show all of them because if you look on the screen here, this is the uh, folder. Uh, this was a, a three building project. So we had a, a building A, building B, and building C. I primarily worked on the big one, which was uh, building A. And when I look into that, there are 226 drawings that make up that particular building, the one that you saw see on the screen here in 3D. It was a laboratory building, but you also have to remember you also have a lot of other disciplines involved. You know, we didn't have 226 sheets for architecture, uh, but you have civil drawings, you know, for the site work, you have structural drawings, you have landscape architecture drawings, you know, for all the planting and all that kind of stuff that goes in after the, afterwards. You have electrical, telecommunications, mechanical, fire protection, uh, laboratory drawings, uh, depending on the spe you know, specialty of the building, you might even have um, uh, you know, advanced security and um, other, other types of data drawings and things like that. Um, you know, like I said, mechanical, plumbing. So all of that makes up a, up a particular project. And as the architect, you're giving them the building, you know, this Revit model that all these other disciplines have to then build all their stuff into it and then also convey on, on paper as well. And all of that has to coordinate together and that's you know, a process that you'll experience in the office. But the point of CDs on the architectural side is one to coordinate all the building elements that go into the project and also coordinate even across disciplines. So 
So there'll be a lot of times where we're showing details and it'll say C structural or C mechanical or C electrical because you want people to know that there's a lot more going on with this detail that they have to go look at another drawing somewhere. And so a lot of what you'll see in construction documents is also a lot of referencing from one drawing to the other, not only within the discipline like architecture, but also uh, across disciplines. Before I go into the drawings, there's another part of construction documents, which is the probably the most fun, I'm going to say that sarcastically, <laughs> is specifications. Every little product, and I've got 280 PDFs of specifications, each one of these have probably multiple pages. So like this one that I open up has uh, three pages, and some might even have 30 or whatever. So there's 280 PDF sections of every little product that goes into the building has its own specification section that, you know, when someone's actually building and looking at your drawings, there's also a accompanying text that goes with it that tells them exactly what the products are, where they're supposed to find the products, what the quality of the products are, and so on and so forth. It's basically kind of the Bible of the book or of the of the project. So you can see I'll I'll just open up um, hollow metal door frames here and you know you've got all these different sections, all these reference standards that you have to um, you know reference that have to do with other agencies that have you know, particular testing and specifications that go for products. It basically guarantees that like someone's like going down to Home Depot and buying a doorknob and installing it on your project when it should have been, you know, like a, a, a better product that the owner actually uses and it tells them, you know, how to coordinate their keying and all these uh, other information. <clears throat> Plus you have all your lead requirements, everyone who's doing lead these days. So, you know, you've got a whole procedure that goes into you know, just putting in a doorknob. You know, I'm, I'll get down to that level of detail there. And there's, you know, seven pages about hardware that go into the into all these projects. A lot of times in offices, you'll have spec writers who will do this, but sometimes you're also responsible for doing your own spec writing. And that's just that's something that's like a whole other class. It's a whole other, uh, you know, time frame and um, your your other. Um, you know, basically something you're going to learn throughout years and years of experience in the office. So I'm going to go back to looking at what goes into your construction documents. And nowadays that we're doing everything in Revit, you want to also showcase your 3D work. It might not be in a, you know, nice rendered view. All these nice uh, renderings that we're doing in class and, you know, pinning up on a, on a piece of paper, that's what you're presenting to the owner so that they can visualize what their design is going to look like because they're the ones who are going to you know, give you the final approval to start your construction documents. So, but with the construction documents, it's now very helpful for the contractors to start to see your work in three dimensions uh, because a lot of times we're, most of construction documents are showing uh, the contractor everything in 2D. You're still looking at things in plans and sections and details. And every now and then it's good to get an overall picture of what you know, you're actually looking at. So a lot of times at the front of the project, it's a good place to show all of these type of renderings or, or you know, um, kind of black and white line drawings. <clears throat> but then once you get into it, basically what you normally start off with is a overall floor plan and in this particular project, we broke it out into separate bid packages. So we had a uh, site plan, we had a site package of documents that went out. Then we had a uh, structural package. So then they could start, you know, basically this was a design build type of project. So as we were still figuring out the design, they were pouring the fit footings and, you know, putting up all the structure. And so we had to make sure we were coordinating uh, from, you know, that we weren't moving things too much around, you know, once things were put in place. Uh, but then after the uh, structural uh, frame went up, we also had our core and shell, which would be basically all the exterior. So what you see here is an overall floor plan of the core and shell of the project. And so you don't really see anything on the interior. But the point of this drawing is to show all the overall dimensions. So you can see we've got dimension lines that start to show um, you know, exactly how big each of these walls are um, and also reference to column lines. 
So you can see a lot of column lines here that have uh, dimensions to, and then everything is dimensioned off the column line because the column is going to be built first, and then you're going to uh, they're going to build off of that. You'll see a lot of section markers. So you guys have already kind of cut sections and things like that within your projects, but eventually when you put them on a page and a sheet, which we're going to do today, uh, just as a quick example, they'll actually automatically populate with a number and then the sheet number that it got put on. So back in the old days with CAD, and I'm going to say old days because back in those days or whoever is still using CAD, if you put something on a sheet of paper, you'd have to go back to this drawing and every other drawing where this section marker is located and type in that this is detail A4 on sheet AE409A. And then if you ever decide to change that number because you had to squeeze in more details and that detail became A4 or A5, you'd have to go back to all the drawings where this was referenced again and you know update it manually. Revit does all this stuff automatically. So as you move this detail around, this A4 will turn to A5 or whatever you end up uh, changing it to, and then that's going to populate all throughout your entire drawing set. That's why all your, your model and all of your drawings are within one, one file so that it knows how to track, track that type of information. You also see these, um, these are called uh, detail callouts. They're these dashed box uh, boxed boxes that are around certain parts, and they also reference a detail number and then a sheet where they're applied. Uh, you know, essentially when you get to certain conditions, you just can't show all the information. You can't dimension everything on this scale, which is eighth inch. So eventually you have to get into certain parts of zooming in on your project so that you can uh, give some more detailed information about what's going on. You also see things like a window tag. So you see this J with a tag on it. You'll see door tags. So here's a door and here's a door tag. Um, you know, elevators. And you can see all the different section markers. All these section markers are either showing a full building section or are showing a wall section that you know the contractor is going to refer to to understand what's happening in this wall. And so for every kind of different condition that you have in the project, you are going to have to show them some kind of wall section and details that show them what's going on uh, with that particular section. So that's it kind of for the exterior. And then after that, uh, we can move into so we've built kind of that exterior piece. Now we'll look at what an interior upfit or your interior plan might look like. You can see you start to get a lot of layers of information on this drawing. One of these drawings could take, and this isn't the most clean drawing I'll admit, but um, you know, your drawings will start to get so much information on it, that's where Revit really comes in handy because you rely on tagging you remember we, we went over uh, doors and windows and real briefly, you know, room tags and then you could schedule your rooms and then the areas for each room. Well, you know, instead of trying to tell everybody all the information about this particular door and the door frame, you just tag it and that tag will tell them somewhere else on another sheet of paper uh, what exactly they're, they're looking at and what that d d particular door should be. And I can see I'm missing the door tag there, but we still covered that. <clears throat> um, so you notice, see we got a lot of interior dimensions and then this was a lab, a lab project so we have all these labs with a lot of equipment in it and there's actually a um, kind of a large call out somewhere or a note that is basically telling everybody to look at lab drawings to figure out in more detail what's going on in all these rooms. Uh, so you can see we also have like call outs around the bathrooms. You know, we still have to see those at a, a, at a larger scale. Basically when you're working at a certain scale, if you find you can't fit all your dimensions because you're trying to dimension certain things and they just start to clutter up the drawing, that's when it's time to make a larger drawing or enlargement of that part of the floor plan and you know, go into a lot more detail. So again, but you'll still see that the section markers are still here from the other plan and all the uh, call out details and this is where Revit is again handy is that again if we change that sheet number or even where that detail is located you know I don't have to go into all these different plans. Um, 
So you've got the floor plans, you're looking at it, uh, dimensioning where all the walls are. Uh, one thing I don't think I mentioned, let me zoom in here, is we also have wall tags. So you see every single wall here has a, some kind of tag pointing to it that says, this. in this case it has G006, here's a G011, um, you know, G302. So every little wall that you put down in Revit, uh, you can tag, you know, you give it a name. So every wall type that you've made, and we've gone over how to make wall types, but each one would have its own number. And so every time that I look at a wall type G006 on the wall type page, <clears throat> that tells the contractor exactly how to make that wall. It'll have, and I'll go to that page in a little bit, but it'll show you that, that basically all the layers that you put into making your, um, the structure makeup of that wall. <clears throat> so after floor plans, you uh, probably get into the you know, exterior elevations. Uh, so you want to show them in elevation. And again, it's all about showing multiple views of the same kind of component. So again, we're sitting there, uh, even though we saw this window type BB in the floor plan, we're also showing it again in the elevation. And so we can uh, even you know, show them where the windows are, what type they are. Uh, we've got keynotes that talk about you know, just the general materials. And then also what all the different floor elevations should be. And then you know, every now and then some notes. So you start to look at it in elevation in 2D. Um, we've got enlarged floor plans, and we started giving nicknames to parts of this project, so, and a lot of it had to do with the contractor. So I've got uh, the portion of the worm, uh, which is here at the north wall, is like the curvy wall of this project. Well, if you look at this floor plan, let me go to the exterior one. <clears throat> If you go to this floor plan, you know, you got this curved wall that's going on, and yes, we had curved glass and all kinds of things that went into this part of the wall. Um, essentially, you know, it's great that you can make a curved wall, but you still have to tell somebody how to lay it out, right? And giving somebody a dimension of a radius does not help them one bit. This radius over here, one of these was, you know, 100 foot. So are you expecting them to go find the center point 100 feet away and then strike some kind of you know, chalk line as an arc you know, to, to figure out how to lay it out? So what we have to do is once we get into um, laying out these type of things or start to get into things that are off the kind of orthogonal grid, we have to start to tell them exactly how to lay it out. And so you start to establish what are called work points. So this curve, you know, this one part of the radius has a start point and it has an end point right there or somewhere. Yeah, right there is an end point and here's another one. And so what we do is you dimension exactly an X, Y, N, maybe even a Z coordinate. You don't necessarily have to do the Z because you're drawing on the second floor, but you're giving them an X and a Y coordinate off of a common datum such as a column line. So you can see this point right here is the start point of this curve. And so we've got a dimension of nine foot two, which would be the Y direction of, off of column line A. And then we're coming off of column line three to dimension exactly where that is. Then they can figure that out. They can put a point there and they can figure out the other end point and put a point there. And then they're able to, you know, you can actually give them the radius dimension of 24 foot six inches and they can start to lay that that out based on all of your <coughs> uh, dimensions and your details that you've done. So this is why we had to blow this up is getting a lot more detail of laying out where all these points are. And then we had to go into enlarged details of showing them exactly what's happening, you know, with the windows and the metal panel. So here's all the details and all the notes that go into, you, have, you know, you have to draw everything, but eventually you also have to point to it and tell them what they're looking at. So I'm looking at sealant and backer rod, aluminum composite wall panels, and fluid applied vapor barriers, and your, you know, all these other types of information that go along uh, with starting to lay out portions of these details. <clears throat> so that's kind of looking at the, the call outs. And all of this came from Revit, and I'll show you here in a minute 
how you get to this level of detail. Um, so after you kind of laid out the, the project and plan for everybody, you know, you probably also look at, and we kind of had these out of order, let's see where were these at. Um, you know, you also have to look at a reflective ceiling plan. You know, you have to look up and you have to tell everybody what exactly that ceiling is. You know, where's the, what type of lights are being placed in each of the rooms? Where is the coordination of the, um, you know, the mechanical? And uh, this was a drawing that wasn't very coordinated and um, so it wasn't a final. You can see we've got duct work uh, hanging out of our ceilings. This is where Revit comes in handy because you know everyone kind of works in their own world for a little bit and then you bring everything back together. And again, with CAD, you would have to do a bunch of overlays and then kind of figure it out in your head that, oh, you know what, this uh, big 24 by 24 inch duct is not going to fit under the structure and then not going to fit where my ceiling is because I want a 10 foot high ceiling. Well, with Revit, and if everyone's working in Revit, you put that all together, and this was one of our attempts where we put it all together, and you know, I got a big red pen out, started circling all these locations where, you know, hey, we're not moving our ceilings, you guys gotta figure out what to do with this mechanical duct, especially, you know, out here in this nice atrium space that we have, and you know, running through our, our metal ceilings and so on and so forth. But you can start to see that, you know, we're laying out the grid, exactly where the two by two grid should be, you know, again, the different lights, um, you get into other level of detail of, um, you know, dimensioning where that grid is placed off of the room. And then, you know, ceiling heights, you're giving them how high they're building the ceiling. And that, that comes in crucial. And the nice thing about Revit is, if you had to lower a ceiling, you know, you just come in here and change that number and your model updates, your sections update and everything else updates. Instead of if you did it in CAD, I'd have to, if this uh, particular ceiling was, um, you know, had to go down from 10 foot down to 9 foot or something like that, I'd have to go into all those wall sections where I showed that ceiling and move them as well as moving them here in the, in the uh, reflective ceiling plan. <clears throat> so once you've shown the elevations, we've done all the plan work, um, you'll get into <clears throat> looking at more of the detail of what's going on with the exterior. This is where those window tags come in. So now we start to look at each individual window type or curtain panel type or whatever you want to call them. We call them curtain walls because they were. Um, but you've got curtain wall type I and curtain wall type J. That corresponds to the tag that's on the floor plan. And so that when someone sees that on the floor plan uh, tagged as J and they come and look at this sheet, they can look at it and see exactly what, what's happening with this window type. The fact that it's three foot off the ground and it has all these different dimensions and and so on. I'll keep going here, get into, you know, looking at the skylight and then detailing the skylight. So you gotta look at all the different connections of, you know, how the skylight is coming down, what's it connecting to. So what kind of structure is gonna be there for the skylight manufacturer to come in and attach to. This is all comes in handy because there's just not one person building, you know, the project. There's all different types of suppliers and there's all different types of contractors that come in on a job. And so basically the skylight manufacturer is gonna show up on site or look at the drawings beforehand and he's gonna say, okay, well, how am I attaching my skylight to this project? Okay, I see in this detail, I have a structural channel that's being provided and I've got a steel channel, two steel posts that's holding that up off of the structural beam and all of that, oh, I have to go look at structural to see, you know, what type of steel this is and then also um, how big all of these uh, components are. Architectural is showing them for coordination, but we're not, you know, actually showing the actual size that this is a W, you know, 16 by 31 or something like that. We want structural to make that final call. We're showing them what the roof looks like in section. So here's your roof deck. Uh, you've got a steel joist and then rigid insulation that's sloping. Uh, what, what's that dimension going to be once, you know, how big is that curb going to be for them to, you know, work with and apply all their flashing. So you got all this stuff that just goes into, you know, this is just a whole sheet on how to build the skylight. Uh, we get into things like building sections, so you start to show overall building sections. 
And then you get into showing what I really think is probably the brunt of most of the construction document work is working with wall sections. And so you've got to show what's happening at all the different locations that vary and are different as you go along the outside of a wall. So these are kind of like wall types, if you will, for the exterior. Uh, but there's a lot more detail to it because you're showing all the structure. You're showing, so we've got a concrete wall that only went up to you know, the third floor, but you know, part of our design had metal panels continuing on. So we have to show that, by the way, this wall is concrete going up to a certain level. And then you've got to build you know, structural studs up on top in order to complete the look of this building. So that's what these wall sections are showing, showing you the dimensions of the overall opening for the curtain wall uh, system that's going to go in. And again, there's not a whole lot of detail that we can show at this scale. So we've got a lot of call outs that refer them to um, another, another detail. Um, again, you know, canopies and front entries and things like that. So this is for every little part of the project that is different. And you can start to see that as we look at different wall sections, I'm just going to keep opening these up. You know, our walls actually vary quite a bit, you know, in the design in order to get the shape and everything. Uh, you know, we had uh, sunshades that were on the, uh, the back side. So, you know, you've got to start to show that kind of information in the, in the, the 2D as well. <clears throat> and again, these are just sections through the model uh, that we're looking at, and then we're adding a little bit more detail to it and notes and uh, things like that. Some balcony details. <clears throat> you know, then even, you know, when you get to certain firewalls, because we we're attaching to another building, so by code we had to have a three hour fire, firewall, and part of Firewalls are, they have to be freestanding and they have to be made so that one part of the building could collapse and the wall is still there. The other part of the building could collapse and the three hour firewall is still there. So you can see we have to show that here's your CMU wall that goes all the way up that is a three hour firewall, but nothing's connected to it except for flashing. So, you know, there's all these type of details that we have to show as we uh, look at each wall so that the contractor looks at it and says, okay, I, I get an understanding of what I'm doing from the floor all the way up to the uh, parapet cap and the metal coping. Uh, after that, you'll get into things like enlarged details. So for all of those wall sections, we've got details where we have to zoom in because we couldn't show them everything. So you've got to show them exactly how the metal panel is returning into the you know, window head, which is a unique condition, but it was a condition that we wanted to have in this particular project. And if you don't show that, you're gonna get the standard detail, the most, the cheapest and the most economical detail that the window manufacturer would prefer to do so that they could save some money. Uh, but, you know, again, you might not get the quality that you're looking for in your, in your project. So that's why these details are shown. So you're telling them that, no, I really want this parapet cap to you know, get encapsulated by the uh, front panel of this uh, curtain wall mullion. And then we get into, you know, again, there's a lot of details, showing them where the edge of slab is, all that kind of stuff. And then you get into the wall types. So we've got a wall type schedule. Remember all those wall types that we um, had. And these are all the individual wall types that went into this project. You end up with a lot of different wall types because of things like code required fire ratings or owner requested sound you know, ratings between particular uh, walls or you might have concrete walls versus board versus CMU. Uh, so we've got all those wall tags that you saw on the plan and then you can see the uh, schedules that are generated that are actually from Revit so it's actually spitting out this information that this wall type was four and seven eighths inch thick. Uh, it was made with metal C studs. I've got chipboard layers that are five eighths inch thick. Some of them are one hour rated, some are two, so on. Uh, here's all the extents of the wall. Is it going all the way up to structure? Is it going just above the ceiling? You, know, you have to tell everybody all that stuff because sometimes you know, not all walls go to structure. Some of them want to stop you know, six inches above the ceiling so that mechanical might have a requirement for 
Um, you know, basically your return air plenum, you'll hear that a lot in the future, um, is actually above the ceiling. Um, and then we've got a reference of a section to look at detail figure, uh, to figure out what that wall looks like in section. And so here we are showing them the sections of all the wall types and, uh, you know, what goes into making that wall. Uh, you do the same thing with doors. So we got a door schedule. Every single door that was placed in Revit is being generated into this schedule uh, with the detail mark and all this other information, the width and the height, what, what type of uh, frame it is, and all this stuff is inputted with each door that's placed. Uh, when you place a door, if it's door type happens to be a door type F, every time you place that family type, we have it set up where it already has all this information in it, but there are some that you have to customize from project to project. But the beauty of this is that it's generating all of this information from the model. Whereas, again, back in the CAD days, you would have to lay out, print out a set of plans and go door by door and make your own Excel spreadsheet, you know, saying, okay, here's door 001. Oh, I have to go measure it in the CAD plan. Oh, it's three foot by seven foot because, you know, looking at a CAD plan, you don't know what it's showing you. You have to actually physically measure it and then you figure out what the door size is. It leads to a lot of error because, you know, somebody could mistake in door 01 to be a four foot door versus a three foot door. And that gets really expensive when you start to make those errors. Uh, so the nice thing in Revit is it's actually showing you when you click on it, it's a four foot door. And if you look at the door schedule, it's a four foot door. So, you know, all that stuff coordinates and uh, that, that's uh, very helpful. You'll see all these little bubbles on the screen as I've been flipping through. Those are revision bubbles. That means we change something else out during construction. And so you have to track all your changes. So you bubble things for the contractor so that when you reissue the sheet, they know exactly everything that you changed. Unfortunately, Revit doesn't do that automatically for you. So you still have to go back and kind of track your own uh, bubbles uh, on, on Revit. But again, it's something that you do with the Revit tools. Um, again, uh, getting into stair details. So we do stair sections. Um, show them exactly what the railing design looks like. And then you get into a little bit larger you know, details of because we didn't have the stair, and we didn't have the details in here yet. Um, and then you get into other things like you know the lab plans and all that kind of stuff. So you know you've got someone taking each room room by room, and then showing them every single little elevation of the room and all the equipment that goes into that room, and uh, you know what needs to be there from on each of the walls. Where's the gas valve for this you know laboratory? Where's the air? Um, where's the fume hood, you know, things like that. And all that is tagged and then later scheduled in a drawing as well. Does it come with line weights for the drawings? Or do you have to set up the line? Right, so let me, um, let me exit out of this and get into Revit here real quick. Uh, the question is about line weights. How do you deal with line weights in Revit? Everything that you're doing as you're drawing is already set up under your management and you have this area here called line weights. So you've got thicknesses that are already uh, established, so line weights one through uh, 16 that have certain thicknesses at certain scales, that's already automatic in Revit. And then um, when you're dealing with your objects, so if I click on a wall, or you know, if I look at uh, manage, object styles, you see that each object style, remember everything that you've drawn on has been on a particular category. So here's a door category. Uh, line weights are set already here by default, but you can go in and change them. So the door projection is line weight two, a door cut is line weight two. You can modify that. You've got all the different parts, the elevation swing, the frame mullion, the glass. All those are just embedded as part of Revit and is already pretty much automatically set up. So um, there should be no reason to change most of these items uh, because all of that's already established and you should be getting pretty good quality prints off of that because it's basically uh, CAD standard, national CAD standard type of setup. But to have you guys do something in class here real quick, 
I want to show you how you'd get to that level of detail um, of you know when you're working in a wall section per se um, just off to the side somewhere or let's start a, let's start a new project I'm gonna open up a new project just so we all have kind of the same screen here and if you draw a wall in the level one floor plan pick the wall that has um, it says exterior brick on metal stud so there's a lot of different layers to it or yeah, let's, no, 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 let's do um, exterior brick on CMU, that's better. And just draw, just draw a wall, you know, draw it somewhere on the screen, turn on your fine level of detail so you can see all the different layers that go into this wall, and then we're going to cut a section. So this would be what would happen in the office is you've got your floor plan, you've modeled all this, and now it's time to take a wall section of this. We now would cut a section, so draw a section through it, and then look at it in section. And when you're looking at it in section, turn on the fine view, and you'll see that, and I'm going to turn off the, or the line weights for a second, that you see all of these different layers that compose of the wall, and it doesn't quite look like the wall sections I was showing you uh, on those um, construction documents. If I look at, let me look, uh, open one up again real quick. So you can see that um, you know if I look at this wall section in detail here, you know I've got things that actually look like cut stone and all this other items that are part of this wall section, and it doesn't quite look the same as when you first cut a section in Revit. Well, Revit's only going to show you at a particular scale, um, you know, all your hatch patterns that go into the different layers of the wall, and most wall sections start at about three quarter inch equals a foot. So I'm going to change that scale. And then what you're doing is you're drawing on top of this with annotation. So click on annotation and you're drawing with either your own lines or you're drawing with 2D detail components. This is a section of Revit we haven't explored yet and we're going to just do something kind of quick here. If you click on component under annotation, so annotation component, and then click on load family. In your Revit library, there is a folder here called Detail Components. If you click into that, you will see divisions 1 through 41. Divisions 1 through 41 relate to specification sections. All materials that are ever out there, if you go look at Metal Panel or CMU or whatever on a website and you're going to spec it or put it in your project, it comes already classified as a particular specification section and then that's you know industry standard some of you might have heard of CSI you know construction uh, the construction uh, standards institute you've got basically all these divisions that they have said if you're manufacturing a metal panel you're always going to be in this particular specification section so Revit has it set up so that if you want to find any of these 2D detail components you look in those same divisions I've got masonry. Division four is masonry. So if I double click on that and I get into, you know, there's a lot more uh, masonry types and uh, so more divisions and specification sections. But if you click on concrete unit masonry and then click on just one of the items on it and hit the down arrow and cycle through and look at all the thumbnail images and you see all these 2D components that show you different parts of a CMU looking at it in different sections. Now this would be the same thing as if you were in an office and they were working on AutoCAD, they probably have things called blocks or they have things called, if you're in MicroStation, cells and everyone would already have their CMU block so I'm going to go to um, CMU 2 core section this is what we're going to load into our project and this would already be in a block or a cell 
or in Revit, it's a detail component family. And so I'm gonna hit open, and then I'm going to just place this off to the side. So you can see it's, all it does is a 2D element. It's not gonna show up in 3D because we're drawing now in annotation mode and it's only specific to this view. If I click on this, look to the left though, there are properties and there are different sizes for this 2D block. Instead of choosing or making, if you were back in the CAD days, you would have to have hire some intern over the summer to make, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different drawings. Well, now you're making families. <laughs> now you're making parametric families for people if you really want to get your foot in the door. <laughs> um, anyway, because, because uh, and I, I kind of joke about that, but it is important. A lot of people out there using Revit, they don't understand how to do parametric families. And if you can get into an office that might have just started using Revit, and there's a lot out there, I mean, you know all about how to add a parameter and apply parameters to things. You could really you know, set up their library um, and you know, help in that regard and then also you know, move into other positions. But you can see that you can select different sizes here. So I might choose the um, eight by, uh, I, there's actually more than nine. I'm gonna choose the eight by eight by 16. And you can see how that 2D element is a parameter, has parameters associated with it and it stretches and moves. If I click on that and hit edit family, here it is, it's just a 2D element. Turn on my visibility graphics and my annotations, and you can see all the parameters that someone put into just drawing this 2D element. And th then again, all the parameters that are associated with it. So again, even though we're doing kind of these 2D drafted things, you're still adding in uh, parametric qualities to it uh, that make hopefully drawing a lot easier so that you don't have to you know, have 20 different files just to show kind of the same thing. So what you would do with this is I chose my eight inch block and I might, I'll might find my eight inch block layer, which is this layer right here, and this is where your hatch patterns come in handy. But I'm gonna tab over and align this block, this 2D element, and if I choose the, uh, once I did the align tool, and I lock it in place, even though this is a 2D drafted item on top of this 3D element, this model, if I make an update to the model, such as moving this wall, my 2D stuff moves with it. So you can start to constrain and lock all these 2D elements to your project, and then if someone makes a change in the project environment, um, you know, as far as the level one, you know, changing from being at zero foot or going up to two foot or something like that, you know, this will update. You don't have to go back and redraw everything. That's another time saver. However, there are instances where, you know, sometimes you just have to redraw. But here's, here's the key to this. I have to show this block going all the way from level zero all the way up, right, to complete this wall section. So am I going to sit here and copy it one by one and or and or array it? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> you are going to then look at the down arrow under annotation component, and there's a thing here called repeating detail. This is kind of a really cool feature in Revit that we can click on that, and again, over here in your properties, it has one that it starts off with. So I'm going to edit, type, and duplicate and let's call this uh, eight inch CMU. And then it's referencing a detail component. So since we've loaded a detail component into the, um, the project environment, I can now pick, and I want my 2D, my CMU two core section eight by eight 16. Then it has a layout, it's gonna have a fixed distance. And I have to kind of know a little bit about this detail to do the next part. And I know that this detail is gonna always in section be eight inches apart. So that's where the spacing comes in. You're saying how often does this need to be spaced as you draw? So I'm gonna type in eight inches and then hit okay. Now I'm gonna delete this CMU that I already did down here because it wasn't a repeating component. Now I'm gonna do a repeating component, make sure I've selected eight inch CMU 
And then you are just drawing a line, and you can see as I draw, it is just repeating that detail over and over again, and bam, you're done. So it's literally like drawing a line in CAD and you just drew that wall section that probably saved, you know, maybe five minutes of time, but you, you knew the, the certain tricks of how to do that. That would be the same thing with brick. So look at, here's my brick. Doesn't look like brick. There's already a brick section done, so I can hit component and choose brick. And then let's draw that. And here's all my brick that's you know, associated with this wall section, and there I'm done. <clears throat> so you can do that with every single uh, item. Let's say I need insulation. I didn't align my wall correctly. Let me tab over and do that. And because that was a repeated element, they're all connected together. So if you select the repeated element, you can move all that in one little instance or align it in one instance. Let's say I needed to put some insulation in this gypboard area or the metal stud area. Under annotation, there's an insulation command. And you can specify the width. Uh, it looks like I probably need one and a half inches. And again, you're drawing the same way. And it draws by near side, center, and far side. And so I can just draw my insulation all the way up and whatever else I need. So you can do this with any 2D component as long as you make it a 2D component. So uh, when you look at when you look at our wall sections here for this metal panel, okay. When you look at the metal panel in section, all we could do with the Revit uh, model was actually apply a half-inch reveal that happened every three feet. But then eventually we had to add in a metal panel that was detailed correctly <coughs> over on top of our wall section. And so I made a repeating three foot uh, metal panel to the detail that just repeated as I drew and, and bam, you're done. So, so when, you, when you draw these and you add these components, Revit knows like which line weights, it automatically scales the line weights so that you know what's cutting closer and farther <coughs> and stuff like that? Yeah, so what, what it's doing is when these details were created, so if I go back to um, a model, let's see, let me go back to placing just a regular detail component. So I've got that CMU, and if I go into that family, these 2D lines are drawn with either a heavy hidden line or a medium line or a detail line, line weight. And so essentially, and there's a lot of times that I actually go into like the 2D components that come with Revit and um, you know actually change the line weight in the actual family and then re-import it into my project. So there, the line weights are actually being set in the family and then that's being imported in. So if we were to draw our own detail, we would have to specify our own? Yeah, so as, you, as you're in this family, like if I click on line, it wants you to pick a category or a line weight to draw on. And so you can just start to draw, and that's that's how you're specifying that. Uh, to the left, the same way you do your families. I uh, know, cancel out. The down arrow there. You can pick all your different family. <laughs> Uh, same same way, annotate um, component and then load family. Annotate, annotate, load uh, and then component and then uh, load the click up here. Load family. So these uh, two D elements that you're putting in are exactly, react and act exactly like any kind of 3D component. You know, you're bringing them in as family items. So you're bringing in a door, but instead of bringing in the 3D door, you're bringing in like a, a door jam, for instance, and you know, applying that to your, to your model. 
And so, you know, at, at some level of detail, you're, you've stopped modeling. You know, you can only model so far, and then you've got to go into this level of detail to start to do your drawings. Now, once you're there, um, it's a matter, matter of um, adding text. So you can click on text, and you can see you've got all these, uh, you know, arrows and leaders. So you can just start to point to things and typing in whatever the text is. And again, all your text is parametric, so you can, you know, expand and contract it, change the text size, and then you can move these, you know, arrows around and all that kind of stuff. So I think I'm not going too much further into that because when you get into an office, everybody has their own method of tagging and noting things. There's ways of manually doing it, which I just did there by adding a text. I can also do annotate create a material tag, and then I'm tagging the material, and if this material is properly set to some name, uh, wherever this material shows up in section, you can hover over and just tag it, and it's actually giving a name there. And then some people use keynotes, so something might have a particular keynote uh, that's associated you know, with something that would show up. You know, there's all these different methods, and it, it depends on the office where you're working. Uh, but basically, eventually you get to that level of detail and then you're adding all that information in. Now, once, yes? Uh, if you've got through the, through the same wall another section, do you have to draw it again or will it serve the parametric? Yeah, so let's say that um, I've got this wall and lay, you know, further down I, there's a window that's cut through it. I need to show that wall section because this one was just you know, some other condition. If I look at level one, and I go ahead and cut another section. Every time you cut a section, it goes back to kind of a default, but I'm gonna go back to my three quarter inch, get the scale set correctly and all that stuff. But you see that all those 2D elements are there. And you're like, oh crap, I have you know, like 10 of, 10 of these wall sections to do. I have to redraw all that stuff? That's crazy. <laughs> I would not do that. What you should do is click on the other section you can highlight everything, go to your filter tab, and I'm gonna just uh, make sure I'm selecting my detail items, insulated batting lines and keynotes and material tags, but turn off the wall, that's the 3D component. Copy it to the clipboard, then go into your next section and say paste, align to current view, and all your stuff is there. And then, and then what you're doing is you're finding the part that was different about that part of the wall section, which is you know normally the window or louver or whatever is in there, and you're going around and editing you know that part of the 2D elements. So you kind of copy that over and over again, and that goes the same as if you do a detail call out. So if I do a call out, and let's say I have a floor slab and all this other additional information here, and I need to blow that up, again when I go into this detail call out, all of my information is not there anymore but I can also do the paste, align the current view, and it's there again. So the, I guess the one part about Revit is that once you get into annotating, there is a little bit of a disconnect between the model and your components that you're placing because it's all view dependent. And again, if you were to accidentally uh, go in here and let's say someone else was work sharing in your file and they're like what's this dimension or this wall section doing here I'm going to delete it I don't need that marker there they just deleted your whole entire drawing that you you know put all that annotated information on um, so you know all this stuff is view dependent it's going to be from one view to the other uh, floor plan versus uh, section you know but at you know, some point you start to break away from that uh, the constraints and the parametric qualities that you can actually, you know, do with BIM. Uh, but the information is still there. You're just kind of starting to graphically show uh, this information. Now, some people actually, especially with windows and uh, 3D components, you can draft 2D elements into your family components. And you can specify that when this component is cut in section, show that particular detail. So what a lot of people are doing instead of you know, doing all this extraneous uh, extra detailing here is if you can put it in the family environment 
you cut a section and then all of a sudden that information's already there and it's just a matter of probably coming in and adding the flashing. I can click on annotate and just draw lines. And so I could come in here and draw, you know, my actual flashing, something like that, or probably change the line weight. And you know, so for some, some level of detail, you could actually make uh, your own 2D element where you're just drawing it on top of here. You can also select that 2D element and make it into a group. So just like you did your, um, your hotel rooms, I could create this as a group and call this flashing. And then I actually have a detail group that I can select. So if I go into another view, even if it's a floor plan, I can click on annotate and um, where's my group, detail group, and place detail group and there's my, my flashing. So you know you can start to even do things like that within there. So you, if you have this detail that seems to keep showing up over and over again, if you make it into a group, and start placing it. Then if you ever have to make a change, let's say someone comes back and says, you know what, this really needs to be a two-part piece of flashing and you need to show that instead of a one piece, you just have to edit that one little detail group and then it populates all throughout your, all your different drawings. Now once you get to this level of detail, now we have to place it on a sheet because we still have to you know, print it out. And what we're doing when we're printing, and I'm gonna turn off my boundary, I, you can show your crop boundary you know, here and there, it is if you go to annotate and click on, actually I'm sorry, view, click on sheet, you know by default Revit comes with a title block, let's just use it for now, it's not the prettiest one in the world, but hit OK and you create a sheet. This sheet would be something, view, sheet, and just click on that and hit OK. Um, so basically this this sheet would be a family type, it's a title block, and your office will have their own title block that you're always using. And so you'll have a FWA title block or whoever you're working for. And that would already be set up so you're selecting their title block, but you can see each time I uh, have a new sheet down here in the project browser, you have sheet and expand, and then you've got it numbered A101, A102. You can click in here and give it a name, so I might call this wall sections. Where is their caps lock? Okay. Wall section. And when I change that, the name over here in the project browser changes. And then, so everyone have their title block up, and they name their sheet, whatever. Now if you want to start to lay out your work, right? You want to start showing your floor plans and or your wall sections. How do you get your information on this sheet? With your project browser <coughs> open, select, for instance, the section one that we created. Hold down on the left button and drag it onto the sheet. And then left click and place it. And you just placed that drawing onto the sheet and it's ready to print. Is that the scale that it is for that section? Yeah, so this will be set to the scale, so it's set to three quarter inch. If I went back into this section and said, you know what, this should really be one inch equals a foot, and then go back to that sheet, that changed to one inch equals a foot, and then it's showing you, you know, how big that looks on the sheet. So this sheet is a 30 by 42 sheet of paper, and you can start to see the scale of your drawing and how that's applied. Next thing, let's say this uh, <clears throat> section, <clears throat> let's say I had it at an inch and a half equals a foot. And notice when I do that, my 2D elements aren't scaling, they're still there, but my text and all that is, they're getting smaller. Um, but when I go back to my sheet, you know, you can start to see, well, what if I had a wall section, and this will happen all the time, that goes off the sheet because you've got four stories or five stories or 40 stories, well, a lot of times what people will do is you right click, I'm going to activate the view. That's like in uh, uh, AutoCAD going into a viewport. If I turn on my show crop region, so this is the region it's cropping this view, and I select that region, you see the little lightning bolts? Click on that, that breaks your wall section up, and you can 
you know, piece it together. You've seen a lot of wall sections before where they have brake lines. Well, that's all that's doing, but it's still, Revit understands that if I strike a dimension from here to here, it actually still reads that it's 20 foot. If you were to do that in CAD, it would give you whatever you just broke that into and uh, it, it breaks up. If you want that to go back together, you just pull it together and bam, it's done. It's back together. It's a large wall section again. Is there a way to set up rulers and like align your views? Uh, yeah, there's a, a guide. You can do guides. So you can do um, grid, guide grids. Maybe now here, here's another thing is that uh, you know what's nice as well is when you're in these 2D elements, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to duplicate this section real quick just so I have another one to place. By the way, when you duplicate a section, you guys pay attention here for a second. If I duplicate this view, section one, and I right click on it and say duplicate, there's a bunch of different um, options. There's duplicate, duplicate with detailing, duplicate as dependent. If I just duplicate it, it only duplicates the 3D parts. If I duplicate with detailing, it brings in all of those detail annotation items into that new view. And then if I do a duplicate as dependent, that basically means that that view, if you make any updates and changes to that one view, it's also updating the other one. That comes in handy when you start to do um, splitting up your plans and you have match lines and all that kind of stuff. You want a one overall plan, but you might want to be doing work in you know certain parts of the plan. Um, Is there like your like the viewport or um, uh, yeah. to hide it? Hide crop region down at the bottom here. So print uh, Right, hide co hide crop region. We'll turn it off. If you duplicate it as a dependent and then do something. Like Draw on top of the dependent one. It, so updates, it, it updates the other one. That goes both ways. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that that is one thing is you know you could like um, have all, a lot of your enlarged details as duplicated dependents, and then if you're adding stuff to it, it's also updating on another view as well. Okay. Now I duplicated all those views, and I'm just keeping them the same for now. But when I go to my sheet, watch what happens when I bring in another section. And if I start to move my section around, eventually you get the dashed alignment tool. It understands that, hey, between this section and the next one, uh, there's a common datum line that you probably want to align across your page. And so it knew to align your floor lines. And um, it also works the same way in plan. <coughs> if you're placing, I'll just delete these real quick, a, uh, a plan view, so if I bring in a plan view, and if I had, um, I need a column. I need a column line. So if I had a uh, column line, and I bring in level two, for instance, you can see I also get the alignment. So I can align my plans, and it starts to have a little bit of play there um, so that you can get things aligned correctly and you don't have to draw extra lines. Now once you've done that and you've placed all of this information onto a sheet, it's time to print. And I deleted all my stuff when I do that. Everyone, I've heard stories of people here at the school exporting their work to AutoCAD from Revit and then printing from AutoCAD so that they could you know, actually print their work. I'm not sure if anyone else is doing that here, but um, essentially all you need to do is <clears throat> if you have this title block, and it's not the prettiest thing, I've got everything you know, broken up, but I've got this sheet. Once you have a sheet of paper, click on the Applications menu, select Print, and I'm going to print to Adobe PDF. Now when I print to Adobe PDF, I need to set up this Adobe PDF printer so that I'm printing to 
an architectural seat, sheet size. You should be able to look this up online if you don't know your sheet sizes by now. But there's Arc D is a 24 by 36. Arc E1 is 30 by 42. So I want to make sure I set this to be an Arc E1. Click OK. And then I can come in here and I'm hitting Select Views and Sheets. I'm going to select that I want to print, for instance, a wall section. Click OK. And then I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK. <clears throat> Save. It's going to print. And let's see what happens here. There's going to be one adjustment that we have to make. You see that it printed everything outside of my, uh, my boundaries. That's not what I want. So I need to go back in here and go back to my print setup. So I go to print. Down here at the very bottom is settings. Click on setup. You always, 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 always want paper placement, offset from corner, no margin, and zoom is 100%. If you use the center placement and fit to page, when you print, it's going to be printing to the, uh, it's kind of like fit to page when you print from, you know, on an 8.5 by 11. You may not be getting a 3 quarter inch drawing once it's printed because it might be slightly scaling it down to fit whatever the properties of, of that particular printer are. So once I do that, I hit OK, and then this time I go ahead and uh, print. I'll get a sheet of paper here, you know, I actually get my actual sheet of paper and then, you know, the wall sections and everything else that are part of it. This is the same thing with renderings and any other parts of your project. You know, you can drag and drop renderings onto here or even images, things like that. As the basic gist of um, construction documents, I didn't want to go into a lot of detail with that here in this class because we're going to go over here a little bit. Um, hope you guys don't mind. But I didn't want to go into a whole lot of detail with that. I tried to do that with the last class um, that we did. We did uh, 4,000 square foot houses and then did construction documents. And you know, you get to a certain level where this class was really about BIM. It was really about uh, Revit and understanding the skills of and holding in on skills of Revit and when you get to this level of detail it really became part of well now I'm teaching you how to do construction documents and how to do a door schedule and all these things that yes you guys need to know uh, but it's not really the full intent of this class you know construction documents should really be a part of another class and um, also it's something that you're going to learn really quickly once you get into um, into the office now, when you get into an office, you're not necessarily going to be asked to do a whole complete set of construction documents. You're probably going to be doing, uh, you know, you're going to be working on window details for a little bit or, you know, toilet partitions and uh, things like that or, um, you know, stair, stair details or probably building the Revit model because, you know, nobody else can in the office and then someone else will do the detailing. You know, things like that. You're going to be doing bits and pieces and parts uh, to a project and being part of a project team. Um, there are, if you're in a small enough office, you know, where you're just working like one-on-one -on -one with an architect or something like that, you may do, you know, from start to finish, but, uh, you know, it depends on your opportunities. Um, for the final in this class, how far did that book make it? Okay. Did everyone look at that? Some pretty cool stuff, right? Obviously, they probably focused in on that, uh, you know, hotel or skyscraper for, you know, probably about the same amount of time as you guys, but they may, may not have been learning a program at the same time. Um, so, that, you know, they might have had longer to work on those things. But the idea there is if you looked at a lot of those uh, sheets that were presented, what were they showing you? They were showing you different views of their project to, sh to try to convey the information uh, to somebody that had no idea, you know, that isn't able to talk to you. They, that, those uh, pieces of paper were conveying information of floor plan, elevations, even, you know, detailed parts and pieces, even though they might have been 3D. 
Um, they were looking at elevations, 3D renderings of the interior, of the exterior, things like that. I told you guys we're not doing construction documents because um, I, you know, I really don't want to see your door schedule. I'll look at your, I'll look at your Revit model and see that you place doors, and I can get, I can generate my own door schedule if I really want to go that far. Uh, but I want, what I really want you guys to do is just like we did for the bridge project. We had two sheets of paper, 30 by 42. And one thing I didn't show you here real quick is that if you take this title block, edit the family, delete all this junk because you don't really need it, but keep the outside border. And if you look at the dimensions, it's actually showing you the true paper size. That's how you make a sheet of paper. So if you had to make a 11 by 17 sheet of paper, you would make an 11 by 17, or you might even make this parametric and have properties that you could pick that would change the paper size. But keeping this border is, the, is your border for your paper. And so you can make any size sheet that you want, just as long as you can match some Adobe PDF uh, paper size to it. So you know if you did like a 36 by eight foot long drawing, you'd probably have to do a customized you know, PDF size. Uh, but anyway, once you've done that, you can load this back into the project. Oops, I went to the wrong one. You know, it'll, it'll overwrite that Autodesk one and then show you your piece of paper that you can then print from. So my thought process here is I'm not going to exactly tell you what you need to present because everyone's project is different. But I would expect I would see some sort of exterior rendering that shows your hotel in context, right? Maybe it's an aerial view or, you know, we are kind of on the water, so maybe it's a shot over the water looking at it so you can kind of get the Manhattan skyline. Um, probably a few interior renderings. Uh, don't go too crazy on interior renderings. Keep in mind they're going to take a long time. Outside shots will take less time. Interior is going to you know, take a little bit longer. But you might take a couple renderings of specific parts of your project that, you know, you've been working on and developing. So it might be one of your public spaces, might be one of your rooms, maybe a room, you know, room shot looking out towards the balcony and you can see the city, you know, beyond, you know, things like that. You know, you figure out what best represents your project. Uh, so I'm thinking three or four renderings total you know, you probably, you're probably going to do, you know, once you start doing renderings, you end up doing a couple anyway, because you're like, I need to show the pool, I need to show this. They don't have to be that big. We're putting this on a 30 by 42 sheet of paper. So, you know, keep your renderings small, but keep them, you know, just as those drawings you saw in that book, you know, they had a lot of information on those pieces of paper. So you could show a rendering and then you can show your drawings and all those type of things small. Were you doing two sheets or just one sheet? Two sheets. I'm thinking two sheets minimum. If you think you need more sheets to you know, showcase your design, go for it. I want you to think about this as sheets of paper that you could put into a book like that skyscraper book, which would be like your portfolio. Because I think your bridge projects, for one, should be a topic of conversation you know, when you're interviewing for a firm. And I think some of you have already kind of done that. Uh, but you know, putting that in a portfolio and saying that was done by Revit, that's going to be showing some high level of expertise. Same thing with these hotels. So think about what you might want to show in a portfolio. That's what I want to see on this piece of paper. I also want to see drawings. So I think your floor plans are very unique. If you happen to have floor plans that are floor plans 10, you know, levels 10 through 20 happen to all be the same. You know, you would only, in an office too, you would only show that floor plan once and the title of that floor plan would be, you know, levels 10 through 20, you know, so that's all the same. So you're not showing it over and over again. Let's say levels 1 through 40 are all different. Go ahead and show them. What I would do is lay out a sheet of paper and I'm thinking you're going to have to do kind of a little bit of collage work. You're going to have to do some printing from Revit and then bringing it into InDesign because I think you can do a lot more a lot more better effects with Photoshop and um, uh, you know with layering of your drawings with InDesign and things like that. 
Uh, in Revit, it's all about placing things side by side, and you don't. It's it's hard to overlap things and get them to show up the way that you want. Um, but what I'm thinking is, you know, you could show a floor plan level, and you might show it at a very small scale. Um, you know, I don't know, one inch equals 30 feet, depending on how big it is. And maybe this, um, I just threw that number out there. And maybe you've got, this is a vertical sheet of paper. So maybe, you know, it should have been rotated. And, you know, I'm thinking your sheets of paper are gonna be vertical to showcase your towers. So you might wanna take this uh, title block here, and instead of making, you know, make this the, three foot six inch dimension and the other one the 30. So you can see it's just like modeling. And then I've got my vertical sheet of paper instead. You know, it's that easy. Um, but you know, maybe you've got your floor plans really small and you can hide, you know, components that you don't need to see, but you could have, you know, a lot of floor plans kind of marching down the side of the sheet they don't have to be that detailed and that big. Uh, they just need to show your general form. I don't need to see you know, the level of detail of all the hatching and things like that. Think about presentation. Um, so you know, really the cool thing would be a really nice large uh, rendering that's of the exterior. Maybe it's like an elevation view. You could also just do some nice renderings and then bring over your elevations right, in black and white form or you can turn on, instead of doing a rendering, turn on consistent colors. And you know, if you had things shaded correctly, you could also, uh, you know, you, if you looked at those uh, drawings that were in that book, not every single thing was a rendering. You know, you could also have just things that were shaded in color or just in black and white. While you're in elevation view, you can also turn on shadows. And if you had, if I had something here on this view to shadow, it would shadow. Um, you know, there's all these different things that you can do. I want you to experiment and experiment with the ways that you can present. You can also do your section boxes. Remember 3D views and you do that section box and cutaways? You can drag that onto a sheet of paper. I want you guys to figure out what best represents your project and place it, you know, on these two sheets of paper or more if you want. And you know you're going to just upload the PDFs to the you know our class website, and I also need your final model because I'm actually wanting to see you know what you've actually modeled inside. Now, what that should also tell you is you shouldn't have to finish every part of your hotel. And I understand this is a big project, and I didn't expect you guys to you know model every single component. It's cool if you did. Uh, because that will show up in all your floor plans and even a full building section if you did a full building section that you placed onto a sheet, things like that. But, you know, if you need to really concentrate on some of the public spaces, you've done some of the room layouts, that's going to show up in plan. You know, you don't have to, like, populate every single floor and make sure you got every little connection with the wall to the twisty form, you know, worked out. Just get something that is close show what you can on, on your presentation um, and leave it up to you know, your more completed detail pieces of work to you know, really showcase your design. I would also like on that paper somewhere, it'd be nice to have some kind of description of what's great about your hotel or what you implemented into it or you know, some little dialogue that describes your project. You know, think of it as a, this is a competition and you're entering that skyscraper competition and you need to showcase your work, someone's going to be looking at it and may want to know some information about it. Cool? All right. You know what that is still? Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's kind of important. Yeah. <clears throat> it's actually in our syllabus. The date hasn't changed and the time, but it's uh, Tuesday, May 8th. And the time of our uh, official presentation was supposed to be from 8.30 at night to 10.30. So you guys would all have to be here. We'd be down in the salon presenting. I'm gonna say 10.30, have all your stuff uploaded. And, um, and that will be your final submission. So we don't need to print it then? Don't, don't worry about printing it. It would be nice, uh, you know, if you guys have some really cool work, um, you know, we might 
print it for, um, you know, because no one's going to be here after that anyway to r really see that work unless we want to um, print it for graduation. I don't know what they're doing for graduation. When is graduation? The 12th. We'll see. I'd, I'd rather you guys not for now and just do your digital stuff because a lot of you have thesis documents that you got to work on, all those type of things. So upload your work. And if the work is really, you know, incredible like the bridges, uh, you know, we might even get the school to print them out at a later time to showcase, you know, around the school as well. Um, and even on the, uh, the school website. I will be around. I'm still here. So email me with questions if you have run into problems or you need any assistance. If there's any kind of consistent problems that keep coming up or whatever, you know, I could, I could come in here if you guys are going to be here and, you know, kind of work through some, some of those things. Uh, but I know everyone at this point kind of disperses and you have your own schedule. So, um, you know, contact me if you need to and I'll stick around here for a little bit. Uh, is anyone for a program? Uh, oh. oh, wait, uh, sorry, one, one last thing. One last thing, guys. Hold on. I'm probably supposed to do teacher evaluation somewhere. No, they're, they're online. online. They're, they're online, online, online now? Yeah. Oh, cool. I don't, they're on the I, I don't know anything now. So, um, do you guys know how to access all that? Because yeah, I don't. They send you an email like once a day. Us with email. Okay, cool. So that's cool. That's why I haven't been bugged with it. Because normally I get a little message saying, you better make sure you return your uh, evaluation. So yeah, please do the evaluations. And um, what I'll probably be doing is after you guys are done, listen up, when you guys are all done and you've graduated, hopefully, um, and, and those that are, you, that are returning, you know, whatever, um, I'm going to send an email out that is normally going to be a... Um, sort of anonymous questionnaire. It's like three questions that I do at the end of all my classes that are associated with my website that ask for your input on the class as well. And I have a, a certain types of questions that I'd, I'd like you guys to feel free to answer. And it's an anonymous email, so I have no way of knowing unless you sign your name. I like that feedback as well. Um, it's not required, but you know, sometimes what the university does, uh, you know, the bubble charts and all that type of stuff, doesn't always help me as a professor to know, you know, where I should kind of direct the class next time. So having you guys just write some things about, you know, related to the topics on my questionnaire helps me sculpt the next class. So they, I think they get better and better each time. This is only the second time we've done this. And I think this class we well went above what, what we got to in, in the last class. So I'm actually really pleased with how this class turned out and uh, I'm anxious to see your final product. And what you're doing for this class, I think, could be competition material and, um, you know, for any kind of competitions that come up. So just keep all that stuff in mind. And you're going to have to keep on working in Revit. You can't learn it all in one semester. I've been using it since 2008, and I'm still learning things on a daily, you know, you find something else that you haven't done or a different way of doing something. It's just the way that those programs are. And uh, you just have to keep doing projects in them. So thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We're not meeting on Tuesday because you guys are going to be partying no, no, after your next. thesis. Of course, we're still watching the whole event. It's been going for 18 hours. So I live in Canada. That's Peter Jones. Julie, can I ask you your question about the